Beloved, as we move towards this weekend, the sixth Sunday of Epiphany, one of the, well, the gospel reading is John's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, which is the wedding feast at Cana of Galilee. Now, I love John's Gospel. You all know I love John's Gospel. I eat, <laughs> breathe, and drink John's Gospel frequently. I want to focus on something very specific as it relates to where we are and how we are being invited to discover that the Lord wants to move us from languishing to flourishing, from surviving to thriving, all by the anticipation of faith, the expectation of hope and the intention of divine love that casts out all fear. Because God is moving us forward. <clears throat> In the story, you know, this is the third day, and there's a wedding feast. And really quickly, the third day for John is that day when Jesus is going to rise from the dead and turn the ordinary water of life into the potency of the wine of the kingdom. And John lays out eight days, if you carefully study John 1, all the way to John 2, verse 1, John lays out eight days that are actually a metaphor for the new creation week in comparison to Genesis 1, which lays out seven days and there's yet to be a rest. So Jesus comes to usher in new creation and bring us into a place of rest with God. Now Nathaniel, prior to the wedding at Cana of Galilee, says, Rabbi, you are the son of God, you're the king of Israel. And Jesus says, because I said I saw you under the fig tree, you believed, you're going to see greater things than these because you're going to see heaven open. You're going to see the angels ascending and descending on me, the son of man, because I am Jacob's ladder. I've come to reunite heaven and earth so that the breach and the separation because of sin and the fall and violence will be mended so that angelic glory can move in the created order and accelerate things in favor of the divine intention. So here's Jesus, the latter, invited to this wedding. Now Mary's already there, and in the, in the story, John refers to her as the mother of Jesus. Why? Because this is really important in John's gospel. She will, she will show up as the mother of Jesus, both here and at the cross. Very important, because there's a relationship between her, metaphorically, and Jesus, because she's a type of the church. She's a type of the church. She's a type of the Jerusalem from above, which is our mother, because he came from the womb of a human being in fulfillment of Genesis 3.15 and all the prophecies about Messiah being the God-man, very God of very God, truly human, God and man, two wills, one person, two natures, one person, indivisible one person, the God-man, God with us. She knows who this is. And yet she's behind the scenes in the wedding and she's been, in, been, been part of the preparations and Jesus is invited to the wedding, a little bit different. He's invited, he's called to the wedding and he brings a bunch of friends with him. Now in those days, if you came to a wedding, you were expected to bring gifts. As a matter of fact, many gifts in those days were wine because they wanted to add to the celebration of joy and rejoicing because a wedding, and wine went together, and those feasts lasted for days. But this is an honor-shame society, and this is a poor family. And the risk involved in running out of wine is the humiliation, first of the bridegroom, and then as a result, humiliation of the bride, and then as a result, because a wedding in those days was more than two people coming together, it was the wedding of two families. Both families would be humiliated because the bridegroom was ill-prepared to honor the families with a feast that could be sustained by wine. So the real issue in this first of Jesus' miracles is an issue of shame and disgrace versus honor and glory. It's not about opening blind eyes, not about unstopping deaf ears or making the lame to walk. The first, very first archetypal sign is a sign of the restoration of honor and dignity and joy and gladness about being part of a family where there's not any big eyes and little use, but we're all seated at the same table and all partake of the goodness of God and we all flourish. None of us languages languish. We all thrive. None of us merely survive. And Mary says, 
privately to Jesus because if she said it publicly to him, she would have subjected him to humiliation in case he didn't respond. She privately says, they've run out of wine. They have run short. This is a very real need. She knows this family's honor is at stake. This bridegroom is about to be disgraced. And yet Jesus says to his mother, woman, he doesn't call her mom, he says, woman. Now that's a whole separate message, but just beware. He says, woman, what does that have to do with you and me? It seems as if he's putting her off. But is he putting her off? Because immediately she turns to the servants and says, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, by the way, that's a statement of faith. Whatever he says to you, do it. She's been in charge of the kitchen help. And now she's taking a step back and she's letting the real bridegroom, the one who's going to be the bridegroom of the real bride, give orders and commandments so that there can be a real feast and no loss of honor. And so Mary, even though he puts her off, she presses in. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking, Jesus says. Why? Because even at times when you are in a place where you feel like you're languishing and it seems like God is hesitant, perhaps he's waiting for a kind of faith from you that is called shameless persistence. That if you'll come to him without shame. You know, the widow, the widow woman that went to the unjust judge, Luke says she was importunate. Her importunity led the, ju the unjust judge to give her everything she asked for. That word importunity is shameless persistence. Learning how to come before the Lord without shame is a learning journey because we are cloaked with shame in more ways than we realize. Brene Brown has done a masterful job in our, job in our generation exposing the pain of shame and the need for us to be vulnerable. And none of us want to be vulnerable. We don't want to be naked because we're ashamed. And yet she has done us a great service by helping unpack the psychological dynamics of shame, which, by the way, lead to a lot of languishing mentally, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically. And so here's Jesus who's inviting his mother to wrestle with his apparent resistance, and yet she becomes the catalyst and the accelerant for Jesus turning water into wine. All sorts of opportunities are present for you when it, you think God is hesitant to accelerate things by showing God your shameless persistence and wrestling with God knowing he's good and that he's going to turn the ordinary into the extraordinary, the languishing into flourishing, the surviving into thriving. And he sees six stone water pots. And that's another thing. There are six of them there. That's the number for men, but there are six, not one. The average household only had one. This means all the neighbors chipped in and brought empty vessels that needed to be filled with water so people could wash their hands, according to Leviticus 11. This reminds me of the story in Elisha's life when the widow woman who was about to lose her sons is told by Elisha, go borrow empty vessels. Jesus is looking for the empty areas of our life to fill them with the water of his spirit because that water can bring a release from shame. And so we know the story. The servants do what Jesus says. It's very simple. Whatever he says to you, do it. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. Whatever he says, do it. Very simple, very profound, very powerful. They take the water, scoop it out, and take it to the head waiter, who all of a sudden tastes it, and it becomes wine. And he goes to the bridegroom and honors the bridegroom publicly. The bridegroom doesn't lose face, he gains honor. And when he gains honor, the entire family on her side, the entire family on his side, and his bride are all honored in his being honored. A poor family that had nothing and ran out of wine now is being restored to dignity and honor. From languishing to flourishing, from surviving to thriving. A miracle is not when God breaks the rules of the natural order. A miracle is when God accelerates what's already present because he's present with creation. You gotta have water to grow grapes. You gotta plant the, the vine, you gotta water the vine, you gotta cultivate the vine, you gotta prune the vine. It takes seven years of an initial process to bring a real bumper crop of grapes that can produce really fine wine because the first crop is never good enough. Third year, the crop is 
dismissed. Fourth year is holy to the Lord, Leviticus 23. Fifth year, you begin to eat the fruit. Sixth year, uh, you let the, uh, you, you take more. The seventh year, you rest. Eighth year, eighth day, new beginning, you begin to have new wine. Jesus collapses time and accelerates the process of winemaking, all while, all while servants simply obey, filling the empty things into the fullness, up to the brim, to the lip, so that there's an overflow, and then takes that overflow over to the head waiter who publicly honors the bridegroom. And when the bridegroom is honored, the disciples of Jesus glorified Jesus because they beheld his glory, his honor, and they said, Herod doesn't do that for us. The Pharisees and Sadducees don't do that for us. If Jesus is going to restore honor and dignity to a marginalized bridegroom that nobody cares about, and he's called us to walk with him, he's going to bring us from surviving to thriving. I want you to lean into Sunday. It's going to be a great day. And I want you to bring somebody with you because all of us need to move from surviving to thriving. How are we going to get there? Anticipation, expectation, intention. See you Sunday.